All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Conversation for Friday, December 2nd, 2022. Thanks for joining me today. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where here is for you. Where are you joining this conversation from? If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis. I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you circled December 31st and you said, I am launching my own thing by the end of this year. Or maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 28 years, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover one topic every day. They all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of entrepreneur architects just like you. So thanks for joining me today. It's a special edition of Context and Clarity today because it is Context and Clarity book club discussion time. So we're going to jump into the book of the day here in just a minute, but welcome. Glad you're here. Like I said, as you get here, say hi. Even if you're just planning to listen in or if you're multitasking, uh, today, that's okay. At least say hi. At least let us know that you are here. Um, I'm looking over at the comments now. I see Chucktown. Sean is in the house. And actually, Sean is the first on my screen right now. So that means that he is the winner of today's John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. So congratulations, Sean. Welcome back from Charleston. Glad you're here uh, on the Facebook side there. Mark R. LePage from Waxhaw, North Carolina, also with us. Howdy, Mark. And Nicole from Arizona. Hi, Nicole. Welcome back. Glad that you are here as well. A little bit of housekeeping. If you are over on uh, Facebook and you're commenting away and you go, hey, why, why is my comment not showing up like Sean's or Mark's or Nicole's or now Rod's, uh, or I should say Jim Croce, um, it's because you are in a closed Facebook group and Facebook has some rules, has a privacy policy that says your name, your likeness, your comment won't be let out of the group unless you give Facebook permission. So we're using Restream as the platform today. Um, there's a URL that has magically popped up in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Um, if you type that in, if you open another browser window, type that in, chat dot restream dot io slash fb as in facebook chat dot restream dot io slash fb and a couple of clicks later you can give facebook permission to let your comments out those show up on the screen just like uh scott's did like rod's did like nicole's and everyone else so if that's going on with you if you're commenting on facebook and it's not coming up on the screen like the others then uh, try that chat dot restream dot io slash FB. Now you might be over on Twitch like uh, Kurt is the Urban Collab. Uh, he's over on Twitch. Maybe somebody will join us from YouTube or LinkedIn or, or even uh, Twitter here before the conversation is over. It's great to have all of you here. I see Scott Thrift says he's stringing Christmas lights on the bridge over the bay. Maybe he's not. Maybe they are. He's living on the edge. No life jacket. Maybe he is. Wow. Okay. Uh, is that allowed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, Kurt, welcome over on Twitch and Wendy Brown from, uh, Western, right? Western Massachusetts. Welcome. Glad you're joining us today as well. I posted earlier in Facebook that if you were interested in joining me on screen and my co-host Catherine McPhail will join me here, uh, momentarily. There she is. Hi, Catherine. Uh, if you are interested in joining on screen like this. Uh, you're welcome to. Just message either myself or Catherine on Facebook, and we will give you the link. Simulcasting, we don't uh, we don't publish that link because who knows uh, who knows what might happen if yeah. we did that. So if you want to join us, you're welcome to. Um, just message us; we'll send you the link. Uh, otherwise, you're welcome to continue to participate via the comments from any of the any of the platforms that we broadcast to. We're, we're on Facebook right now. We are on um, YouTube right now, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, and we're on Twitch right now. So you're welcome to join us from any of those places at, uh, at this point. And if you'd like to join us on screen, you can do that. You're muted. Oh, I was just saying that it feels much better. I was feeling a little crowded. 
So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was feeling a little like yeah. I was filling <laughs> up the space a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ed Shannon, welcome back from Spirit Lake, Iowa. Glad you're joining us today as well. All right. This is not the final Friday in November, as you may have noticed, but the final Friday in November was uh, Black Friday. So we decided to push our book club discussion back a week. That's usually at the uh, at the end of the um, <clears throat> or, or the final Friday of the month we discuss the book club book of the month. So we push that back. Today's the first Friday in December and the November book that we'll discuss today is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. Um, So question number one, who's read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein? Let's see. I read it too. Let's see. John Jones says he's lurking from Westport while finishing a lighting plan and hopefully getting a proposal out. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, Sean says he read it. Great. Glad to hear that you did. Um, <clears throat> again, you're welcome to join us here on screen. If you'd like to do that, just shoot a message over on Facebook and we'll we'll get you here. We'll give you directions for that. Um, let's see. Scott says the bridge is white and little not a big international orange in Battleship Curry. Okay. So it's not the bridge that I had in my mind there that he's stringing lights on. <clears throat> Good to know, I think. <laughs> um, the, uh, so who else, who else read The Color of Law? I think it's a uh, uh, Daryl. Hi, Daryl, uh, over on LinkedIn. Uh, also, let me open up LinkedIn here. Daryl, if you would like to join, I know I said message on, uh, on Facebook, but if you're on LinkedIn or or somewhere else and you would like to join, just send a message and I'll send you the link Um, there. I, if anybody's messaging me, I don't have access to Facebook right now, but I will in a second. I will be right back. I have, can you hear the HVAC people vacuuming upstairs? They're also cleaning service. You can't. Okay. I just unmute again. All right. Let me, so Sean, What's the link? I'm sending him the link. Um, and again, anybody else that wants to join, just let me know either via Facebook or LinkedIn and we'll, uh, we'll get you here. Sean, Sean wants a link. I sent it to him. Oh, good. Okay. Him to him. Uh, John, Catherine, John wants to know if the heat is working yet. Does it look like it? <laughs> If, if the weather, if you're getting the weather from here in the Midwest, then I hope your heat is working soon. No, you know what happened to me? I went to the bank and I had to get a check for the guy because I couldn't find my checks. So then I handed the guy my card and said, it's from this place. And then he said, this is cold. And I said, well, I don't have any heat. He said, <laughs> and he said, no one should live like that. He just looked like, it's okay. That's, I'm, it's okay. I'll be okay. But he was, he was concerned, which was good. It was cold, hard cash. It was a cold, hard plastic card. <laughs> there you go. Hi, Sean. Hey, Chuck Town, Sean. There he goes. Tim says the Facebook restream wasn't working, but uh, people are commenting from Facebook, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Wendy says, I got through some of the book. There was also a local presentation back in the spring about redlining in the city next to me. It was interesting because I lived there until I was 10. Okay. Uh, Daryl said he would love to join. So Daryl, I'm going to send you a link over on, uh, um, on LinkedIn here. Hey, while people are joining, can I um, ask an irrelevant question, but people might be able to help me with my problem? Yes. Okay. I, I just dropped a hammer on my husband's guitar. Yeah. So that's, and the consequence of that, I'm wondering if I can somehow get it fixed. I'm going to show, I'll show it to you. (laughs) Well, um, (laughs) I mean, I didn't actually drop it, but I knocked it off of a shelf. See that hole? Yeah. His Uh, guitar is going to gently weep, but I'm going to gently weep too, because I'm in big trouble. See? Oh, right there. Yeah. I'm, on duct the tape the will the hole. It's not a hole. Like, it doesn't go all the way through on the edge. But it still sounds like a regular guitar. Maybe he won't notice. There's certainly someone 
in an area near you that um, works on stringed instruments. Yeah, I'll tell them he just has a yeah a luthier, but can they fill it in? Is my question, or will it change the um, sound of the instrument? Mm. That I know. God, I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> Mark says he thinks you should start running. <laughs> Kurt says it has, it just has character now. Yeah, I'll tell him that. He'll feel better about that. Mark says you should uh, blame the HVAC contractors. Oh my God, that is brilliant. Oh my God, what am I going to do? <laughs> Who said that? Mark did. Oh, Mark, good idea. Scott says his uh, mother did that to his guitar. Um, I got a guy at Griffin Music in Palo Alto. Yeah, that's not so that convenient for me, but oh, well, I'll find a luthier and take it in, I guess, tomorrow. Yeah. Ed says that Neil Young's guitars are pretty beat up and he still sounds great. So just tell your but husband you know that he sounds like Neil Young. But now I have that moral dilemma of either blaming it on them who've already done worse to my house <laughs> or admit I did it myself uh, by mistake. This, the ethics is next week. That's a tough one. Really? <laughs> uh, okay. Nicole says someone's getting a new guitar for Christmas. So maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering. I can either trade it in for the same kind of guitar. I don't know if this is his nice one or not. This. <laughs> Or you know what I could do? I could put this away and take out his other one and put it in the stand. And maybe he won't remember which one he had out. There you go. Rod says is it's it, the Willie Nelson model. Is it Aspen? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Okay, no, let's get back to the book. Is, is anybody besides Sean going to join us today? Uh, yeah, I think Daryl is uh, on his way. Jefferson said he had to restream again. Read first half of the book, dense and depressing, hoping the second half... Ha, uh, has how we move forward. Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, Mark says uh, fairhavenfrets.com, so oh. you might want to take that one down. Kurt says he read the book Thanks, last Mark. summer. And uh, Maria, hi, Maria. She says the HVAC guy will be using this video as evidence in court. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's I think that's true. your answer right there. That's Way true. to go, Maria. Way to go. Solve that problem right there. Um, okay. So the color of law is, is actually why we're here. Uh, Mark says symphony music shop, symphony music shop.com. Um, Rod wants the link. Okay. Let's send Rod the link. So immediate takeaways, we're still going to have a couple more people coming in here, I think, but immediate takeaways, Sean, I know you were, you were, uh, on clubhouse this morning. Uh, as we were discussing this, but I don't think uh, you got a chance to speak up. Um, what are your immediate impressions of the color of law? To put you um, on the spot, I guess. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, it was eye opening, but it was also like, yeah, I told you so. Um, right. Mm -hmm. For me, um, yeah. the the depth of it it went a lot deeper than I, I thought it would, um, or or rather, it went a lot deeper than I had knowledge about. I had knew about a few things, um, things I had seen or heard about from um, family and friends uh, growing up, and a few things I, I kind of learned through the years and some at school, but I just did not realize it was that expansive and a lot of um, government entities, how they manipulated things to continue to kind of push the segregation, if you will. And it was just like, um, it was baffling to me. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. I mean, it was really overwhelming actually. How, how pervasive it, it is and was and that it just seems impossible to get, um, you know, to get ahead in any way. Yeah, I, I think the, um, <clears throat> for me, the reason that when you guys had said the book, this was the book we were going to do, it was around the same time my daughter and I were having conversations about it. And we were having conversations about um, 
reparations and things. And I was like, well, you know what? Let me do my research before I, you know, say, hey, before I jump into the argument of reparations, because I want to be able to talk from an educated standpoint to say, hey, look, the government or whoever did have a hand in this and, you know, here are all the facts. And this book just kind of like was the highway to a lot of that information. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I at the end when he was talking about the um, buying up, having one version of reparations might be like Levittown, for example, buying up a percentage like 21 percent or something of that of the, the next 21 percent of the house or OK, the next houses that are for sale until I get to like 21 percent to be uh purchased by the government and then sold at the uh, at seventy five thousand dollars, which would be the relative amount. You know, it was like the price that that black people could have bought it for back if they had been allowed to buy it, you know, but they weren't allowed to buy it. So now it'd be like three fifty, three seventy five or whatever. And then but it would be available to, um, you know, it would be available to purchase for that much less. The you original know? price. Yeah, for the original price, because. Because that they sh they should have had access to it. That you know, I'm surprised that 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 they're only worth that much money. My parents bought a house for fifteen thousand dollars and sold it for seventy thousand. So I would have thought that. But that's beside the point. But you know, the yeah, however much they originally cost. I, mean, I guess they were because like because what people don't what people don't consider when this, this whole reparations discussion is that they think that, they think that um, um, I'm echoing here. It's Jeff. It's Jeff. Oh, is it? Okay. No, it's not Jeff. It's one of you. Did you guys change your, your sound? Well, I thought I muted my Facebook. And we're so okay now. Maybe it was Jeff. Somebody else. Um, people don't realize that just because you end a policy, people, they think you end a policy, so then everything's equal or everything's equitable right. now, right? Right. You know, just like, oh, we ended slavery, so everybody's equal. Well, yep. not really. Nope. Um, and it's the same situation, same case with, with that example. There's so much loss, probably trillions of law, dollars in lost, you know, wealth. Yeah. Because of these policies, right? Or certain segments of the population, and yeah, it needs to be made up somehow. It needs to be, it needs to be paid back. Yeah, um, I don't it know does. exactly how you pay it back. You know, maybe examples like that are good examples. Um, but but it's yeah. a book everybody should read because I think once you've read the book, there's just no doubt. There's no possible way i don't think there's any possible way anyone could say that um there should be no reparations like they're just handouts you know that's like it is so um beyond what i was ever taught and i feel like such an idiot how did i not know all these things it's just so um it's just so prevalent and even even as i'm saying this morning in boston too we think i it was all about the South, but it's not, it's just, anyway. Boston was the most racist city I lived in in my life. Yeah, it's bad. Wow, it's bad. that was awful, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was one of the things I said this morning is that, you know, when I, when I got ready to jump into the book, being originally from Atlanta and going back to a, back and forth to Atlanta all the time, I expected to crack this book open and, or, <laughs> you know, virtually speaking, listen to it and hear lots and lots of stories from uh, Atlanta, you know, Charleston, deep South kind of cities. And, and that's, you know, just for whatever reason, that's, that's the way I, in my mind, I thought that this was going to go. It's like, Oh, you know, here in the South, they did this and here in the South, they did that. And so I was, I was somewhat, surprised i guess that first of all he, he opens up the book and and it he opens up talking about a supreme court case um and then he then he talks about the fact that if it can happen in san francisco it can happen anywhere 
And that was the first real story or, or case study in the book. And I went, wow, didn't expect that. And then, then I kept listening. And actually, the majority of the stories were not from the South. Right. Um, I guess, depending on where you, I mean, there's Louisville was in yeah. there and some, some places, but, um, but yeah, the, it's, it's not a just in the South problem, obviously. No. Okay. This morning you were talking about um, when apparently I was walking along panting with my dog. Um, you were talking about um, block busting, but you could remember what it was called. Block, but it was blockbusting where people would would tell people it wasn't even true that black people are moving into your neighborhood, and I was shocked to read yes. that they would hire actors to go in and be like, yes, just walking through the neighborhood with their baby carriage or like riding through the cars with their volume up. That is such bullshit! I can't even believe it. Am I allowed to say that word here on? Line? Probably not. Anyway, it is. Oh, I can't even believe it. I can't believe. Well, well you, know, you grew up in Boston. I mean, they had all the busing issues, right? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Boston. Yeah. And then yep. what I was thinking about when we were talking about that this morning mm -hmm. was all in the family, that TV show. Oh, yeah. When the Jeffersons moved in to the block. <laughs> and, you know, it was like, you know, Archie was just so flipped out about it. Um. That was like that, using comedy to address a serious social issue. I used that to think it was about my. Well, then they moved on up. They moved on up to the east side. Yeah. Yeah, they did. To a yeah. deluxe apartment in the sky, I think. That's right. I went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I think the the whole. I mean, th this book covers a lot, right? It's, like I said, it starts with the Supreme Court case, and and Rich Grustin, the author, argues mm -hmm. that the the factual basis of the Supreme court decision is actually incorrect, right? The, they have the facts wrong. Um, and, and you hear about, so you hear about that Supreme court decision and you hear about fair, the fair housing act and you hear about redlining and zoning and uh, things the police did and didn't do in certain situations and schools and, you, you know, all different um, I'll, I'll run down through the, the chapters because I think it gives a, a nice little kind of a bullet point of all the different um, ways that he lays out that this is um, this has happened over time. But that blockbusting idea to me, in a way, I mean, even the, he even talks about places where crosses were burned on the lawn, right? I mean, that well, that's yeah. sort of the, the yeah. ultimate um, uh, the, the ultimate in a, no, it's not the ultimate in aggression because, you know, we had lynchings and things like that, but, right. but that, but that's, but that, that's obviously, you know, in, in your face, but I think, I think the blockbusting efforts are one of the things that amaze me probably the most, because it's not only, and to me, this is the subtitle of the book is, um, the Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. So we've got legislation, we've got zoning, we've got all different ways, you know, police, what they didn't, didn't do, et cetera. Yeah, the police weren't any help. That's not surprising. Yeah. But when it came to I the... mean, that's natural. I mean, not natural. That's uh, in the black community. I will, I will always I will say, hey, look, yeah, we know that like. Yeah. And this is you can see this now. The results of a lot of that is well, we don't call the police because there's this distrust, obviously, for over policing. But if they do come, they're not going to do anything anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which which is a sad, sad state in itself. Um, well, weren't they originally it, um, for to get to capture escaped enslaved people? I mean, wasn't that their whole thing? Native Americans? That's and how a lot of the, the police uh, policing started, right. yes. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but, yeah. But then the, the, the blockbusting went beyond, right? That went beyond officials, right? Where, yeah. where um, uh, yeah, real just... estate agents, as part of their ethics, were not allowed to sell to black families. And yeah. then you had the, the whole idea of the blockbusting was that someone, a black family moves into a neighborhood, a real estate person goes in, starts knocking on doors and say, hey, did you know 
And like you said, then they're hiring actors to walk around like, oh my gosh, the blacks are taking over this neighborhood and it's going to destroy the property values, which, which then in turn has people panicking and moving out. That in itself is terrible. But then the ultimate goal was profiteering off of that. Right, exactly. Yes. And, it, and it's just like, it, it takes it to a whole different yeah, it's place. Just- those but people city have officials a lot of- even joined in on that, Jeff, because the book talked about how um, city officials, how they levied the taxes higher in these yeah. areas. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. That, when I heard that, I, I listened to the audiobook. That yeah. part really blew my mind yeah. that these same the, these minority communities, black and brown, more black, they were levied higher taxes. Yeah. And then yeah. So that compounded to the fact that now we got higher taxes and now they're having to move more people into these areas Mm -hmm. because they can't afford the homes, which now overcrowds the schools and the government is not giving the school the resources nor building newer schools in this area. And we still see these problems today. Right. 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 You know what else? Years later. You know what else blew my mind is that they have this, um, it used to be that, I guess it used to be for everybody that you had a mortgage and you paid it off and then you got the house, right? But then they came up with the amortized mortgage. So you had equity going along, but only white people, of course, only white people could do that. So then if they had, um, you know, a black family gets a mortgage they have to pay off the whole thing. Or if they get kicked out in the meantime, they lose everything. Like they're not, that is so unfair. It makes me want to cry. It's so unfair. I just feel awful about it. It it makes for smart criminals. Damn, I just can't. I mean, how how upsetting that you're in your house 19 years and somehow you get kicked out, you miss one payment, you know, and then they they raise all the taxes so it's harder to make the payments. It's like, and the fact is too, that kind of gets me going. I'm a little upset, I guess. The thing that gets me going is that we just kind of have a generic thing like, oh, well, it's the government or it's the real estate people. Not saying it's like, he never comes out and says it's the white people who want to maintain power and wealth. Like we don't, we don't, it's like, it's, it's like a passive thing that's happening to all, all these people, but it was actual white people who wanted to keep all of everything. Anyway, I just wanted to say well, that. The, the idea is, is, um, and, and this is the argument when, you know, I, I start to talk, I start to hear when people start talking about reparations, where it goes to that feeling of, a, I didn't do it. B, right. why do we have to give something to that person? I'm not getting anything. And it's, you know, I, I try to tell people when those arguments and things start to come up is you have to look at our history. And this was done in the reverse. And we see in this in this book, it was done in reverse. Like they're not getting it. I want it. And I'm going this way. And we're going to. We're going to set it up to where these people over here can't get it because they're bad people. Yeah. I would, I would, I would maybe not just say it's white people. It's certain it's capitalism because you had the same issues of, you know, this, this equivalent of like this housing discrimination you had, uh, Corporate or you know these you know, robber that. barons that wanted to you know coal mine or owners of coal mines or steel mills or whatever and then they would threaten you know if you don't take less money we're going to replace you with these you know Polish coal miners that have just come over kind of thing so it's just like you know these greedy 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 people that will do anything to screw somebody else out of something you know oh well, we yeah i mean we've got a we've got a history it, it so let me back up half a step because you know the the book the uh, the color of law is purposefully written to look at how the government segregated in terms of of essentially black and white but but especially um to me, it's a history of how we've mistreated African-Americans, you know, over hundreds of years here. But we have a rich history in the United States. And I know it doesn't stop at the United States. It, it's other places as well. But 
of the people in power basically mistreating the others, whoever others are. Um, and I, and I, I said this this morning, I said this to somebody the other day as well. Um, as I was listening to this book, I thought, you know, if I close my eyes and I listen to, uh, listen to this book and I imagine it as some sort of dystopian future, futuristic novel or something like that, or, or dystopian past, or I don't know, whatever. And then I open my eyes and I look around on December 2nd, 2022, I might go, oh my gosh, this is actually a story about December 2nd, 2022. Because when I look around what we're doing right now in the United States, in our society, we're doing this to a lot of the others, you know, put the others Mm -hmm. in, in quotation marks, right? Um, I mean, people are trying to pass legislation and are passing legislation on different fronts. So the the context changes a little bit, but we have a a rich history of that in the United States. And, you know, at some point, which is one of the reasons I guess I appreciate this book so much, is that we've got to come to grips with that. We've got to um, accept that at the very least say, Hey, yeah, this, this happened. This is, this is happening. Um, there are, you know, we can look around and see direct results every day of everything that Richard Rothstein lays out in this book. What are we going to do about it? Reparations, no reparations. I don't, I don't know. Um, there's not going to be any easy answers to anything, obviously, but simply going forward, what are we going to do about it? You know, w- without maybe ignoring the reparations question for a minute, what are we simply going to do today, and tomorrow, to move forward in a in a different way? I think that's the that's a really big question that we've got to um, I think, we've got to try to tackle. I think as a country, we really do have to look our, ourselves in the face and yeah. and understand the race because. Yes, it is a, a um, problem with capitalism, but it is a larger part race because I was just in a um, I was just in a lecture about two or three weeks ago, and it was talking about um, how there was a city, I believe it was Durham, North Carolina, or, um, or Winston-Salem, one of the two, um, was started as a black town and it was burnt down uh, very similar to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this happened a lot in a lot of cities, more so in the South, um, but it happened a lot across the country when there was this seeing this black flourishing economy. Right. Black middle class and black professional When it class was flourishing, it was like, no, why, why are they flourishing? No, this can't happen. We got to do something about this. So that that transcends capitalism to, you know, it does get into the race thing. And, and we see it, like you said, Jeff, we see it now in our country because it went from blacks, where it's always still black people, but also to Muslims and, and also to um, Hispanic people coming in across the border. And, and I'm just like, whoa, like, time out. We really got to watch what we're saying and what we're doing because... We're continuing the cycle. Let me ask you this. Is capitalism the tool? I think in in some parts, but capitalism can be a, a, the tool used in a positive way. I mean, sure. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, the way yeah. I'm approaching it is, is the person that's using whatever resources and tools they have available, yeah, whether yeah. it's capitalism, whether it's power, uh, whether it's influence. Um, it's just... It, the powers that be, the people in those positions who can leverage those tools. Yes, it, power, I think, is that's a good way to put it. Wendy says, I kept wondering how things would be now if they let the integrated neighborhoods be rather than segregating them. What a missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, you know, just like you were saying, Sean, it, when the, the, um, the different, um, the different, towns and cities that have been burned down. I mean, we, you've got all those stories where um, it was Tulsa, right? That was once the, the richest um, 
that Wall Richest Street. city yeah, or Wall Street, yeah. yeah yeah black there you go black wall street that's what i was looking for mm-hmm. um yeah what would it be like if if that had never happened um, well that's just a horrifying event that i never knew about either before about four years ago yeah. i don't know it's just i have regarding what we can do right now i'm pretty sure i've mentioned this before but my cousins there are a group of my cousins and i are um putting together a donor advised fund about how we can do reparations to people that we might, our family might've profited off of or kept from, you know, living their lives as they should have or whatever. And, um, you know, I feel like I don't have, we can do something like that, but that's not that. I mean, you can't just go give people money, but the idea would be like donating to groups that um, have come up to try to help marginalized people. Yeah. That we probably <clears throat> had a hand in marginalizing. There's a. Uh, oh, Go ahead, ahead. Right. Well, I, there was there was a um, uh, a comment by uh, Maria about the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo, which was after the Mexican American War, and I lived in, I went to school in New Mexico and lived there a long time, and I'd never you know never heard of that until I moved out there. Um, you might have read the book or heard, read, seen the movie The Milagro Beanfield War by John Nichols. And that's based on something that happened because they were having some, they're still having these tree, you know, these land ownership disputes in New Mexico. And somebody ended up like there was like um, uh, attack on a courthouse or something by the someone who was disputing their you know, being cheated out of their land in the 19th century and they're still trying to get their land back. So just pointing out that, you know, it happened to other people as well. You know, um, again, we're 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 concentrating on this book, but, um, you know, well, I I can speak to that, right? Yeah, because my wife is Hawaiian and I started learning about Hawaiian history. And with within the past 60 years, just how Hawaii became a state. I mean, you could really look at that. That land was t- taken. It was stolen. It was our government marched in to a sovereign land and said, no, you are ours now. Um, so so we've been doing this. You're right. We've been doing this to not just black. It, it, it just the story. I will say the story with black people, African-Americans, which everyone you want to say, I grew up in the 80s. So I say black. Um mm-hmm. uh, that one carries a lot more. Um, but for me, like when I was having this conversation with my daughter and I was like, look, you know, it's, it's opportunity. Like, like I can't speak to, I'm, I'm still doing my family history and trying to learn, you know, where my family come from, where we've been through and everything. And so I don't know if my family was in any of these cities where the land was burnt or taken or anything, but what I can speak to is opportunity. Um, I bust my butt to get where I am today. Not that I'm anywhere special. Um, I had a lot of hurdles, more so than a lot of my peers. Um, and just having opportunities. If if there was a way we could create opportunities for people, like whether it's uh, going to college for free. Um, if you're not going to college, you know, it's um, creating opportunities where you do have where you can get grants for home purchases and you don't have to pay that money back, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, opportunities for all all kinds of opportunities where you starting a business where you get grant money, where you do not have to pay it back. And I'm talking substantially uh, and a substantial amount where it helps you flourish as a business owner. I I certainly did not start my business, um, with, with any money except the money out of my pocket. But if there was a grant that could help me start my business, fund my business, buy equipment, um, where I could have went to school for free, that would have been a heck of an opportunity for me to, to get a leg up and establish myself or my family. And those are the kind of conversations that we're talking about in reparations. You know, people's like, oh, it's it's we're not gonna give people millions of dollars, even though that could be the total amount. I'm not asking for a million dollars. Mm-hmm. I don't think no one really is, but it's it's the opportunity, you know, um to and I'm not even talking about leveling the playing field. It's the opportunity. I, I come from a family who has been poor for a long time, and reading this book explained to me 
partially why my family has been poor um, because there were neighborhoods that my family, my grandfather who fought in the war couldn't live in. And we were kind mm -hmm. of pushed in certain areas. And so having these conversations is great, but we got to, you know, take them to an action and say, Hey, look guys, we, we got to stop discussing and start doing. Yeah. I think, I think those are all really good points. And it's, you know, for those of you that haven't read the book story after story, um, similar to what Sean just shared, you know, somebody, somebody who's a veteran of a war that fought for this country that can't live in a certain neighborhood because of their skin color or somebody that worked at a Ford plant that moved from somewhere to somewhere. And then they ended up commuting for more than an hour one way because they couldn't live near the new Ford plant location. Um, you know, back to those opportunities and Sean, you and Catherine were talking about the, the mortgages and, and uh, um, Kurt brought up the fact that in addition to those mortgages being designed the way they were, that interest rates were higher and, yep. and also variable and not fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that Wendy brought up here, she says uh, she just learned that the city next door that she was talking about before, when the railroad came to town, they split a fairly prosperous minority neighborhood by running the rails through it. And this put the railroad in the path to access to the center of town here in Indianapolis. When the, they built the interstate system, yep. they uh, took the interstate through basically the East near East side of Indianapolis and cut off the working class folks from the jobs downtown. So suddenly, you know, it's not easy to get to, or maybe not even possible to get to your job anymore. Um, there's something I just heard in the last day or two. It didn't have anything to do with this book, but, um, uh, oh, it, um, it's a documentary or something about, uh, the, the, the Edgewood Chicago, Edgewood, uh, neighborhood in Chicago that whichever rail company goes through there, they're basically forcing, I think they called it the last, um, middle-class black neighborhood or something like that. Um, but basically a, a once prosperous, relatively prosperous black neighborhood, they're forcing, it was like 3000 families out of there uh, so that they can build a rail switching station in there. Mm -hmm. It's a prime location for them to, you know, I don't know what they're doing with the trains, but, but um, the, the story is apparently about a, a woman that said, um, uh, how, how did it go? It was, it's more eloquent than I can remember, but, but it was like, uh, I'll, I'll be the last house standing or something like that. It's either, she's fighting them and going to court and things like that. But it's, it's, it, this came up in the conversation yesterday with, uh, yeah. with Melissa Wackerly, you know, what, what about when there are families whose history and culture and whatever wealth they have accumulated, which may be incredibly modest, is tied up in some lowlands area that's hit by uh, hit by hurricanes, right? What do you what do you do about that? You they can't just pick up and move, right? Everything right. they have well, is there. I was talking about that this morning. Uh, it was a story that I heard on NPR about that very issue. I think it was, I think it was Mississippi River, but it was further up. wasn't where I am. It was further up north, and they wanted to these people to relocate because of the flooding floodplain and their houses weren't worth enough, even if they paid a market value for them to go anywhere else. Right. It was, you know, the houses were only worth like, you know, yeah, less than $20,000 or something. So um, it wasn't as if they could pick up and move and buy a house somewhere else. Uh, so they were like, well, we're not going anywhere. So what do you think about um, how this is there any connection with this book and the policies that were in this book and some of the housing crisis that's going on in the country now? I just watched a documentary about the unhoused uh, people in L.A. and Oakland and Seattle. It was a little documentary on Netflix called 
I forget the name of it. Something back home. Uh, take me back home or something like that. Take me home. And it was just mind boggling. I had no idea, you know, these tent cities that were, you know, just ran, it seemed like for miles along these streets and some of these cities. And yeah, I wonder if any of these policies that we're talking about in this book. Oh yeah. Affect this, you know, oh, yeah. Think about it. way. Right? So, so if you have a pool of money, okay. Or you, you just have you just have a, a big chunk of money and everybody's in there and you take a section off this thing like 80% of it and group all of this 80% of this money and then move it out and then you the, the rest of this 20 uh 20% that's left and you start raising fees and they're struggling this money this pool this minority community becomes poor and you've taken all this money out and moved it to the suburbs right white flight right and now there's no connection and you continually putting your arm on this community and they're getting poor and poor and poor what happens we're seeing this now um all across the country and i can speak to my city where i live or my town i live in mount pleasant south carolina it was previously a lot of uh former slave land you have um settlement communities that were here that that years ago owned most of this land. Well, now it's one of the bougie areas. A um, lot, lot of money in this town and a lot of the uh, people have moved out. And so now they're complaining. The, the uh, town and a lot of people here are complaining about jobs. They're complaining about traffic. And I had to let them all. I said, look, our city is so expensive. The people who work here, the regular everyday jobs can't afford to live here. So you've created a problem because way back when, when these people used to live here and it was quasi mixed, we started doing all this stuff and white people left. We The price went down. White people brought it up. The people living here can't afford it. So they have to move somewhere else. We're seeing that. Yeah. Um, there was another thing that came out of this um that blew my mind and I kind of knew about it was um, years ago living in government housing. If, uh, and this is also documented in the Pruer Igo myth that government housing said, Hey, you had to be a single mother to live here. So right. they affected families also by separating families, taking the fathers out of homes. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's, it, you know, and that's something with the with the housing issue too. It's it's you know they put all these requirements on people before they can get any housing, mm -hmm. and they can't they can't meet the requirements because they don't have any housing. It's like this catch twenty two. It's like, well, how can you get a job if you you can't even take a shower or have an address or anything? But um, no, when I lived in Chicago, I noticed that too. Um, I would take the train out to, um, you know, there was like a reverse commute. Like the people coming into the city were either stockbrokers that like lived in Hinsdale or mm -hmm. the people who came to work in the city that couldn't afford to live there. Right. It was like a lot of, you know, service workers yeah. and things like that, that were, that were coming into the city as much as there were professional people coming into the city because the city had become so expensive that, you know, a lot of working class people didn't, you know, didn't live there. So yeah, fortunately, I think in that's a city like Chicago, you have transportation where you can, you know, 45 minute train ride or something. You can, do something else while you're riding the train or something. So it's not so Are we seeing the reverse of that now though? Because we're seeing cities have all these quote unquote poor areas and they're buying them up and they're um, renovating them, making them really nice. And people are moving back into the cities and the black community and black and brown who can't afford it are moving out to the suburbs oh, either right. by being forced out or being pushed out. Right. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. This, the, you know, there was a 
there's a desirability to live in the city if you can afford it. And it's just like in this documentary, it's like all these homeless people. And then in, in the background, they're building some high rise condominium, you know? Yeah. And yeah, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that, that this, that the, the um, this is not a, it, even though this is a, what was the forgotten history of how our government segregated America? This is not history, right? This is current. Um, the um, w- one of the things that happened here, there's a near north suburb here in uh, Indianapolis that has uh, gained quite a bit of aff- affluence over the last, say, 10, 15 years, something like that, 20 years maybe. And they have recently been successful at bringing in some restaurants and some retail and things that they didn't have before. And as it, it's sort of like what you're talking about, Sean, except it's, it's, they have their own city center there. So it's not the city of Indianapolis. It's the city of Fishers is what it is. But, but so as it gets more and more affluent, it pushes people out. Right. And now they build, um, you know, they've got these restaurants and so on. And of course, nobody that lives there wants to work in those restaurants or in those mm-hmm. stores. Uh, so there's a proposal and people have been pushing for a long time. The smart people around here have been pushing for a long time for public transportation, especially that runs up what we call the Northeast corridor, because that's where a lot of the people are, are doing those commutes that you guys are talking about. Um, and the mayor of that city basically said, we don't want public transportation coming up here and bringing, I, I, I think he literally said something close to this and bringing those people, bringing the elements that aren't from here to here, you know, which number one is, I mean, just when somebody tells you who they are, believe them. Right. Um, and number two, it's like, Hey, what are you doing here? You, you, You've got these places, you're celebrating bringing all these places that you want, all these, the restaurants and all of that. Nobody that lives there wants to work there. You don't even want to make it um, uh, livable for somebody that is going to take one of those jobs, right? You've got whoever it is, it's got to now, because there's no public transportation, how are they going to get there? If they have a car, maybe they have a car, maybe they don't have a car, Um that now they've got to do this commute that's longer, more expensive, all of those things, because you don't want the, maybe the rapid, the rapid transportation of those, those, those people to come up here and serve you. I mean, that's, that's so offensive on so many different levels that it's not even funny, but that's, that's the attitude. And Chad says, welcome to Hotlanta. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, that's not, that's not unique to anywhere. Right. Um, but it's just, it's one of those things. It's just sort of in your face. You know, let me do a quick, um, I always thought, you know, it's like, it's like I'm in San Diego and La Jolla has always been kind of like this, Oh, this like uppity, you know, wealthy community. And then I was talking with one of my friends, um, and she's she's an architect, and her husband is uh, president of Noma. I think I put this in the chat, but she was she was telling me, and 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 La Jolla was one of the areas that said that they didn't want the trolley to come in to you know they didn't when they were putting in the trolley line like over about thirty years ago uh, they didn't want the trolley to be coming up to anywhere north or north county because they didn't want you know right it's the same thing that people say in La Mesa they don't want you know it's like oh the trolley brings crime to La Mesa I'm like yeah it doesn't bring crime but but um crime trolley you know, then she told me then she told me you know she goes well La Jolla used to be black and I said what and I said like. I've never heard that before from anybody. And she goes, yeah, La Jolla was a black area until they pushed all the blacks out of La Jolla. And then hearing this thing about Palo Alto, right, again, considered to be this wealthy white area. And that was a black area. And, um, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just, I mean, it's interesting. And I can, I can remember, you know, I mean, I grew up in Pittsburgh and it's very, um, 
you know, it's it's segregated by the communities, right? And and from all over the world, right? People would move into the area and then they would stay with people that were from the country that they were from. And and I can remember I asked my mom, like, why don't why don't we have any black people in our school? And she said, Well, the realtors won't sell to them. And I can remember like thinking, what? Like, I mean, that was like a totally foreign concept to me, you know, and so now kind of this stuff, but I said like, oh my God, like this has been happening and we've known about it for so many years and yet it still just keeps, it just keeps happening, you know, yeah. over and over yeah. again. I think, so if you haven't read this book and we're coming up on the, on the hour here. So if you haven't read this book, first of all, you've got to, you, you just, you just got to read this book because like LaShawn said at the beginning, some of these things he, he knew about and had heard about um, and some he had not. And I imagine that we're all in that same boat is that, um, you know, you've heard this, that, or the other, but you, I, I'm pretty sure you don't know the extent of what's covered in this book. So I thought I would give a quick rundown. This is actually the chapter list of the book, but I think it, it does a good job of, of sort of um, uh, giving you the key points of the book. So uh, chapter one is public housing as a segregating agent. Uh, to how racial zoning laws segregated cities. So if you know the term redlining, that's a lot of that. Uh, chapter like three, how the federal government worsened residential segregation. Four, the public-private push to segregate. Five, how the IRS and regulatory agencies furthered segregation. Six, the cooperation of localities. And we touched on that a little bit earlier. Seven, unequal incomes and racial residential segregation. Eight, the lasting effects of historical segregation. Nine, what is to be done? And then there's a postscript that's frequently asked questions. You have, don't stop at the end of chapter nine. You've got to read or listen, you know, however you're consuming this. You've got to listen to the frequently asked questions because this was published in, 2017 you know so uh richard rostein has been out talking about it and you know it's it's been a topic of discussion for what's that five years maybe going on six years at this point and i i, I thought it was intriguing to hear his thoughts in the years since it's been written based on feedback pushback interactions, conversations he's had since it's written. Um, I, I really think you need to read or listen to the postscript as well. So that's I, the uh, color of law. Sorry, go ahead. I say one thing that I loved in the um, frequently asked questions, one of the questions was there is a um, part in my deed that says that an, oh, no black family should be allowed to own this property. Yeah. And he was saying, instead of just taking that out over the question was, how do I get that removed? And he said, instead of having it removed because it's unenforceable now anyway. So just say this was on my day, this is repugnant and blah, blah, blah. So you're like dis disavowing that or whatever, that that would be part of the history. Just keeping it on there is just letting people know what the history of the whole situation has been. I thought that was a, and then you say that you like this, it's, whatever, you know what I mean? So that it stays in there instead of being erased. Yeah. So that, yeah. I think, so that, I think that was, know. That's a good point. That was a that was a good one. You don't you don't s simply remove the language that restricts a black family from buying your home or, or a black person from buying your home. You actually you actually re uh, repudiate it. So uh, I, that was a great suggestion. Jessica says in the comments, she says she's really grateful to Sean for being willing to participate in this and offering his perspective. Yeah. In in equity in architecture is hard to ignore. Only 2% of U.S. licensed architects are black. That's about 2,000. And only 0.4% of U.S. architects are black women. That's only about 500 in the whole United States. We're lucky, we are lucky to have Sean's voice and other BIPOC members commenting. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. So, Sean, thanks. Um, thanks for joining us in the conversation and, and all of these conversations. Um, not, not just the one today, but especially the one today. Um, I know we're past the top of the hour. Actually, I actually have to 
to run here momentarily. So what I'm going to do is, um, first of all, thank you to everybody. Um, for those of you that have read the book, for those of you that are reading the book, for those of you that I hope will still read the book, uh, thank you for that effort. Uh, thank you for showing up for this conversation. They're not easy conversations. Um, get that. On a lot of levels, they're not easy conversations, but they're, they're ones that we need to have. And as Sean said it earlier, it's my question, I share this with Sean, is what next? Right. It's one thing to have these conversations, but what do we do now? Um, so that that's that's what we need to keep pushing for. So thank you to all of you. And, and one, keep the conversation going, uh, because the more you comment on these, even after we're not live anymore, uh, for instance, in the Facebook group, if you comment, uh, that will pop the uh, discussion back up to the top of the timeline in the Facebook group. I don't know if you knew that or not, but. You can keep this going, keep some momentum in the Facebook group, and I think that's important. Um, so, so let's let's definitely do that, and let's talk about what next steps are. Um, again, you can you can read the last chapter, especially in the the uh, postscript in the book, and Richard Rothstein has some suggestions. But uh, but what can we do? You know, from the profession side uh, and the personal side, what what can we do? as we move forward now. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I just wanted to point out there's, I heard an interview with, a, with another scholar, Destin Jenkins, who's written a book called bonds of inequality, which is similar in scope to the book we've been talking about. And he was, it was a really interesting interview. Um, I haven't read the book, but I want to check it out. And then there's another one. Let me look at my notes here. Um, called Iceberg Zombies and the Ultra Thin. And that's more yeah. about uh, housing, uh, sort of financialization, capitalism of housing. Um, and he's that's by a guy named Matthew Souls. So, yeah, that, it, that one's it, on my list. Yeah. So. Speaking of list, what's the book for this next month, Jeff? Do we know? The book, the book for Grinch. the Context and Clarity, the December Context and Clarity Book Club will be Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Guidara. G, I, I'm here. Unreasonable it's Hospitality, it's called? Unreasonable Hospitality. What's the um, Will, what's the overall? Yeah, what's what's the synopsis on the? The, the synopsis about? is this was actually recommended by my um, uh, by my mastermind group. The synopsis is basically about customer service or, or client uh, client experience is is the oh way that uh, we would put it uh, uh, in in our profession. So unreasonable wow. hospitality. Now that's like my whole TikTok feed is about unreasonable hospitality, all those uh, hotel and restaurant stories. No, I'm not on know. that side of TikTok. <laughs> Are you? That's all I see all the time. <laughs> I, I'm, well, it's not all I I'm see, on, but it's mostly. Uh, I see that. Right now, I'm mostly on the music and trivia side of, of uh, TikTok, it seems, which is not disappointing, honestly. I hear a lot of divorce stories and people cheating, getting cheated on like all <laughs> all night. That's all I watch. Well, yeah. After after you drop hammers on on guitars, it's, oh, you know. thanks for reminding me, Jeff. I'd forgotten about that. Why don't you do one? Why don't you do one like that, Catherine? Me? Yeah, uh, I'm still so married. I haven't cheated on anybody yet. About, so <laughs> about the guitar? Um, here I'm thinking of making up a story a about this. About well, because my daughter's on TikTok and she would see it, and then I would look very unethical to my daughter, so I can't do that. You, should be, able to get that. you should be able to get that guitar fixed pretty easy, I think. Okay, good. You should be able to go in and fix that up. It doesn't sound Why any is different. It on the though. floor anyway. It wasn't on the floor; it was on its stand, and the hammer was on the on the bookcase. And I knocked the hammer off, and it went boom, boom, boom on the. She was practicing her axe throwing what? is what was really going it, on. It went broom, broom, like the law and order. Kind yeah. of, kind of. More of a casual version of it. Yep. 
All right. Well, thank you to uh, to everybody. Uh, Jay says, Jay Caroli says over here, um, thanks for putting this book on the list. I, you know, um, thank you to everybody that recommended this book. And I, so I have the spreadsheet, if you didn't know this, but I have the spreadsheet where I document everybody's everybody's recommendations. It's a long list. So thank you to everybody that, that always uh, recommends books. And, you know, we'll never get to all of them, but, uh, well, but there's some great. Uh, look, great I know we have to go, but I know we have to go, but are we doing this next year or are we done? Is this our last book? I don't know. Put that as, as you get ready to wrap this up. Uh, yes or no in the comments book club next year or not. Uh, one, you know, Chad's mentioned cliff notes. Um, and Chad, Chad call it echo notes. Uh, one thing I did say earlier, if we do this uh, next year, that um, and I may do this whether or not we do the book club next year. I'm probably going to provide cliff notes next year in the form of videos. That well, um, nothing else to do, Jeff. So that, yeah, I don't. I don't. That. I just sit around here and look at white walls all day. So <laughs> yeah. well, I like the, I like book club, but I have to say I'm more interested in books like this than say some business, business book, book or <laughs> than say unreasonable um, hospitality. You know, these are, these are more, I think, I don't know. They just are more eye opening, kind of. Or well, they get your juices. Call to action more, books, I think. You know, and call, right. call to action books. That's that's a good way to put it. Call we to action, call to action yes. books. <laughs> yeah, that's a good so we could we could. I know Jeff loves the business books and loves dark chocolate. These are things I know about Jeff, but um, we could maybe do half that's business true. books and then half call to action books. Call to yeah. business books. Call, mm -hmm. call to business books. There you go. Yeah. Well, that's just me. I mean, I don't know. You know, other we people. Half and half, right? Alternate. Opposite alternate. Way. Alternate. Right. We can alternate. Yeah. I mean, we that's did fine. this year. To, I mean, it should just credit. We did read some non-business books. Like, sorry I'm late. I didn't want to come. It was a surprise. <laughs> surprising one. Um, we've had some non-business You can tell which ones came directly from recommendations. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm. Uh, I am. Uh, you know, can especially you, can after you name everybody's. All the books that we read. Can you name all the books? Can you name the? I book can that... after we wrote them out the other day. <laughs> Atomic, Atomic Habits. Yep, Didn't that was January. Um, 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 uh, no. what's that one by Chris? My Ross? brother actually, my brother actually brought Atomic Habits into the thing, and it's sitting on our coffee table. And every time I look at Atomic Habits, I don't, I don't think like, oh, I want to read it. I just think about Jeff and the group. You just, think, you just feel guilty. Is that, that was actually Your a pretty good book. I mean, that was kind of a call to book. action book in a way. Anyway, I liked it. Um, well, we'll talk you about that. Do you actually have week. to read those books, or can you just read the inner sleeve of the book? Or um, Yeah, I got to say it's a little padded, Rod. You could maybe read the first or the second chapter and then forget the rest of the book. You know, it's how it's like the title habits. of the book, and then there's like well, a subheading like, of the book. Like, yeah. you know, do this now, and then it's like tells you what to do, and you don't have to actually read the book because it just told you mm -hmm. what – how to yeah. take charge of your life. Take charge yeah, of your they, life and stop worrying. Okay. Right. Oh, right. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. Stop worrying. Go do something. That's the, that's the subheading right. for everything. All right. Well, Jeff, we have to go, right? Or don't you have somewhere to be? Yeah. All right. You got to go. Yep. Atomic. Here, I'm going to read them real quickly. Atomic Habits was January. Never Split the Difference was February. I read that one. Well, I watched the master class on that one. Yeah, it was a good. Oh, that's, that's good. Dare to Lead by Brene Brown was. Um, oh yeah, I was packing up my March. house when I read that book. Uh, April was Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Stephen Covey. That was up. That was a slog. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. I didn't want to come. Was May. I like that one. And we got to talk to the author eventually. Hello, I'm. Uh, like six months later or something, right? Yeah. Right. Start, it start off. with why. Start with why was June and I July. That. And then August was um, uh, how to write one song, loving that the I things remember. we create and how they love us back. 
Um, Radical Candor by Kim Scott was September. Ah, there you go. October was Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. Did we read Financial Mindset or was that just me? That was just you because we oh. talked to Joyce Smarter. I wonder how many books you and I have read for our guest, Jeff. But anyway. A lot. A lot. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, wait, so we... Color of Law was November. Color of Law was November, right? Yep. And if, well, and if you're not nice, I'm going to pick... Um, uh, hang on, I've got to scroll to find the... <laughs> I forgot the name of it. If you're not nice, I'm going to pick Scramble. A business thriller by Marty Newmeyer. What do you mean if we're not nice? I think that would be pretty pretty great. Can we just read that instead in December? Why is it called the Scramble? We don't you know yet, Todd. We gotta read, read it. Oh, okay. The the main character is an architect. It's a good book. Seriously, why can't we just read that in December? Why do we have to Scramble. read you, would you rather read Scramble in December? You, Nobody's gonna can... read it. Nobody's gonna read it, so isn't there any kind of uh, holiday-oriented uh, architecture business book out there? Maybe that's what holiday. It is. That's the book you should write, Jeff. You have to write the holiday uh, no, hang on. business book. There, there's a book about Starbucks that the is Christmas um, bonus by Jeff Eccles. What's what's the uh, the one? There's one about Starbucks that has a Christmas title to it. I forget what it is. Ho ho ho. Yeah. So, how Starbucks broke my union for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not it. Anyway, all right, all I right. Go. We'll, stick, we'll stick with uh, maybe we can start off the year with a thriller, uh, like a post holiday mystery would be nice. Okay. All right, we can do that. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having us read this book. It was, it's everybody should read it. Especially the people who think there's no problem. Well, the, the thing about it is, I know we got to wrap it up, but I'm not surprised that almost nobody knows about this, right? Because, frankly, most people don't know really anything about American history. Well, yeah. Um, at all. So even these more detailed and minute aspects of it they certainly aren't going to know about. So, right. um, yeah. so carry the book you know, around with you when you go to your coffee shop and put it on the, on the table and, you know, maybe you have a conversation about it. Do every day. Here. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, sort of good points. Next week on uh, Context and Clarity Live, Jamie Claire Kaiser, who is a principal and the director of mergers and acquisition services at... Zweig Group. So I'll post about that tomorrow morning. Um, what do you want to know? What do you want to talk about next week? Um, mergers and acquisitions could be a way for you to get started. Could it be a way for you to grow? Could be a way for you to exit. So, um, okay, be wait. Interesting conversation. Catherine, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, okay, I just got a thriller book idea just now. Yeah. Just you said. mean like for us to Mergers write? and acquisitions. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's funny, Rod, because I heard of mergers and acquisitions also. <laughs> Murders. That would be a lot more interesting. You guys have. I, I started today, uh, this morning, I started listening to Bono's new book. Bono. So. I was listening to Randy Rainbow's book, but I didn't like it. I wasn't in the mood, I guess, to listen. I, mm. I must have been in a. It's a, it's a good book. What's the guest name for next week again, Jeff? I was writing it. Jamie Claire Kaiser. I wish we could have Randy Rainbow. Which is J A I M E C L A I R E K A I S E R. There's an awful lot of AIs in her name. <laughs> Jamie Claire Kaiser. Jamie Claire Kaiser. They probably did that on purpose. We'll have to Maybe. ask her. A burning question. Heart the hard hitting questions. She's into AI. What can I say? Maybe she is AI. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. I, that would be perfect. I think, yeah. I've talked to her a few times. I don't think that's the case, but maybe. It's good AI. <laughs> like the, the good witch. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, guess what? It's beer 30. Beer All right. 30. Beer Enjoy 70. the 30.
the beer 30. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thanks time. for a uh, <laughs> good title of a murder ballad says John Jones. Uh, thanks for this discussion. Again, I know these aren't uh, necessarily easy conversations when we get into topics like this, but really appreciate all of you and um, have a great weekend. I'll post about Jamie Claire Kaiser. See, it rolls off the tongue, all those AIs. Um, post Claire. about that tomorrow morning. You tell me what you want to talk about next week and we'll kick it off at 9 a.m. Eastern Monday morning on Clubhouse, and then same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern in the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. And we'll make an announcement about 12, 12, 12 mm. on Monday. Yeah, keep going my anxiety there. now. 12, 12, 12? <laughs> Yes. 12, 12, a 12, a 12, 12, 22 now. 12, 12, 12, 22. Sorry. 12, 12, 22. Um, and I don't know if you saw this, but yesterday uh, several people mentioned the uh, Pretty Good House, uh, December 13th through 16th. Emily Mottram will be doing four days of Pretty Good House. Um, uh, uh, I just went out of my Maybe. head. A, 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 Say it again. Workshop. It Pretty Good House Workshop okay. Training. Um, sign up for it. The link is in the Facebook group. You will earn 12 HSW CEUs. Ah, I not need any after that conference. Can I, can I hold Over them the over courses. for next year? Those are HSWs, 12 HSWs. Nice. Yeah, so at the conference, you only got, what, one, two? A, f- a couple, I think. 1.5? It's 1.5. 1.5 at the conference. This is 12. This will this will probably satisfy, depending on where you live, I would think this would satisfy all of your HSWs. So uh, check that out. Uh, four days, 12, 12 HSW credits on the Pretty Good House. I know a lot of people have been interested in digging into that further. So that'll be December 13th through 16th. You'll see more about that. Michelle, right. how's your ankle? I guess it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. All right. Gotta go. All right. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>